in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and ScoreNorth.com. You understand what to expect at times versus a guy that's just getting plugged in or um, uh, playing a role that you expect, you know, one of your top tier guys to be at, you know, for the, uh, to, to be, um, um, you know, eligible to play for you um, for uh, in games. So yeah. uh, to get AB back is going to be big for us. Um, like I said, although our linebackers has been playing great in my opinion, but getting a guy like AB back definitely enhances the defense for sure. That's the, uh, the all things covered podcast with Patrick Peterson. At what point, boys, does he use that platform to just turn on everyone, to turn on his teammates, turn on, turn on his coaching staff, Zimmer? Like, he's still like, yeah, yeah, our linebackers are awesome, you know. I mean, Anthony Barr is going to come back and like, two weeks. They lose to the Lions, and he's just like, I want out. <laughs> so I've listened to it a bunch. I don't think he's going to do it. Like, I've been waiting for some, like, just sort of small crack, right? Because, like, that's how it starts. You're like, some week you just get this small crack. It's it's usually not, like, a classy, classy meltdown. It's usually really classy, really classy. I, you know, I'm not quite sure. And then, bang. I'm not get, getting that. It's such a positive podcast. And McFadden, his poor partner, every week keeps picking the Vikings to win. Oh, no, so, dude. so like. Does, does Pat Pete pick? Pick the teams. Like, was <laughs> no? Was, do, do we know? He's like, I don't like, know, man. The Browns look pretty good. I think we're probably gonna lose this McFadden one. McFadden <laughs> must bet a ton and stuff because he he's always like he in college games. He's got games and stuff, but he every week he's like, I picked <laughs> the Vikings to win by ten points. Pat P. <laughs> he picked them to beat Cleveland. It's like, yeah. well, I mean, so did we. By so, the way, so did we. Right, but I'm just saying what I'm yet to hear him say. You know what? You guys are screwed, Pat P. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one here. I think um, I'm seeing a 40 gonna... point loss, and I think someone gets fired, Pat. You're what do you think? Gonna, you're not going to win, Pat P. <laughs> your thoughts. <laughs> and your linebacker is really not as good as I expected. <laughs> uh, so, this is Mackie and Judd, daily Minnesota sports entertainment. And um, we're going to get to write that down predictions and an accountability session later on in the show. But I have for you guys, and maybe this can open up a a larger discussion about and obviously hindsight is 2020 although i will say going into free agency a lot of people said maybe you should load up on the offensive side of the ball maybe you should give your you know, you know your statue quarterback some uh, extra veteran protection up front and they went the other way right they said no 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 we're going to get dalvin tomlinson we're going to get patrick peterson we're going to get bashad breeland we're going to spend pretty much all of our resources on defensive players well <laughs> we're four weeks into the season here and uh, the Vikings' run defense in particular, which is what was keeping Mike Zimmer awake at night for months in the offseason, right? That Saints game was just looping in his head, that Christmas week game. Vikings' run defense this season, 25th in yards per game allowed, 136. 28th in yards per rush, 4.8 per rush allowed. The Buccaneers, by the way, are like 2.5, which is amazing. That's on pace to beat the Williams wall defenses from 12 years ago missed tackles the third most in the nfl um overall defense the vikings are 28th when you include pass defense to 28th in yards per play allowed 6.1 yards per play yes. allowed by this defense yep and uh, oppo get this okay opposing quarterbacks have a 104.1 passer rating against the vikings so far and that includes baker mayfield looking terrible on sunday in that 14 to seven game. So um, I guess if you could go back, it's not even, it's not even really a, a, a 2020 hindsight thing. Cause like, again, a lot of people were saying this before free agency, but did they make a mistake putting so many chips on the defensive side of the ball? By the way, Michael Pierce might be out now. It's so hard to get everything to gel defensively. Right. It felt like they were so close with a couple upgrades to just being a top five offense. And now the offensive line struggles again. Um, I don't know. Go back in your time machine. They make a mistake. Well, you've got a top five offense as far as skill position, position guys go in my belief. Like if you put them all together. So I'm not saying that I'm now kicking Kirk into a top five QB. If he's protected, if, he is. But, but right. And and if he has and if he's protected and he has Jefferson, Thielen, Cook, we thought Irv Smith. That's a top five offense from a skill position standpoint. Yeah, um, yeah I do consider this to be a bit of. of a hindsight, but Phil, you're right. Reflecting back, we did talk in March. Shouldn't you sign a guard? Shouldn't you sign a guard? And that's the position that I think 
And so, so like Pat P and Breland, like those are second tier free agent guys. So I'm not saying, oh, you should have turned that into another receiver. Uh, but the Tomlinson signing and which followed the Pierce signing, which are your last two marquee free agent, like early on, we're going to target this guy and get him. And if I'm not mistaken, at the same time that they targeted Tomlinson, they also pursued defensive end. You know, the one thing I don't recall the, them pursuing a really good guard. And so I think it's very fair to say like your offense is good. Your defense is suspect. It needed help. So I'm not advocating that signing anybody. I'm not saying, oh, just bring that defense back and allow it to fail miserably. But should you have taken your day one target and made that a guard? Well, yeah, you should have. And, and you should have if for only one reason, Kirk Cousins. Like we're seeing, this is, and the whole conversation about Kirk, people hear things, so I'll try and be clear as possible. But we have seen... Um, protected Kirk and we have seen hurried Kirk and they're not the same guy. And if we, I'm can, glad you didn't say unprotected Kirk. Un, I don't, <laughs> don't, ha, don't have me go there. Don't because I mean, I've got a lot of thoughts on that. Possibly. It's in God's hands. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? That's okay. Let's not go there. No, 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 no religion on Mackie and Judd today. But anyway, we've seen both of those Kirks and they are vastly different. And the Vikings, know this like like it's not like oh man uh Mackie and Judd and Declan are seeing something that nobody else saw we know what the price is if Kirk is not protected and we know how good he can be when he is so I think the answer to the question is should your first inclination have been we've got to get a lineman to anchor this thing like we got to go and get the best guy if if you know Thune was a possibility that's great but even the guy after him we got to get somebody who's going to anchor this offensive line because it's not like they signed Dalvin Tomlinson and we all said, oh man, Dalvin, you got Dalvin Tomlinson? I've been a Dalvin Tomlinson fan for years. It, felt like, not, a it felt like a luxury, right? And of course, felt, if, if Pierce is going to be out for the season now, it's like you're, but my, you're probably happy you signed Dalvin Tomlinson. But my point is Dalvin Tomlinson was, was a guy who we were like, who? Oh, I have to go on my Google machine and look him up. So if you had signed the same type of guard, I would have preferred to go in that direction. But, you know, what was in hindsight now the conversation? Because I I think it was Mike saying, Rick, we can never have a game like we had against the Saints again. I want this defense full of veterans and to be as good as possible. And this and we've got to stop them. Well, the reality is if you had sat down like with a big group of people that knew football and listened to them, they probably would have said, don't you want to solidify the unit that's close to busting out? Yeah, it it, it felt to me all throughout the offseason and just surveying the wreckage of the defense in 2020 and where the offense could maybe go. It's It felt like the offense was very close with a couple, hey, if you can just get a little more support up front here. And I'm not talking about like cross your fingers draft support. I'm not talking about you know, high upside Ole Udo. I'm talking about like guys who have done it for five years before plug them in. They're veterans and they're ready to rock and roll that this would be a top five statistical offense that it wouldn't just be, well, they got the position players. It would be, you know, the whole thing is top five. Cause you're not worried about, for instance, what happened against the Browns, 29 pressures allowed in that game. Um, and so I have a, a, a few different thoughts on this. Number one, I don't think it's easy to just say, well, they should have gone and signed offensive linemen. There really were only, to me, you know, just looking at the list of guys who were available, there were really only, once Once uh, Brandon Scherf was franchised, he was the uh, Washington football team uh, free agent guard that they just franchised and took him off the market. Then there was basically one needle-moving guard, Joe Tooney, and then one needle-moving center, former Packers center, Corey Lindsley. And I think everyone else beneath them, so like Matt Filer signed with the Chargers. He went from Pittsburgh to the Chargers. He was a guard. He's actually been one of the worst pass-blocking guards in the NFL so far this year. He's great as a run-road grader, but like he wouldn't, have been, he wouldn't have been a needle mover. You would have had to sign Joe Tooney to play left guard. Left guard, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty sure he plays left guard. Yeah, left guard. Um, or Corey Lindsley, who was one of the best centers in the NFL for the team you play twice a year, Green Bay, and he was available and open. He went to the AFC, right? 
Okay. But that would have required, for Tooney, it would have required opening up as much money as possible, which they sort of did in increments throughout the offseason. Correct. Not signing Patrick Peterson, not signing Dalvin Tomlinson, and making a full-on, full-court press the minute free agency opens. Against, by the way, the Kansas City Chiefs, who are a very appealing team to play for, you know, and 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 Pat Mahomes, a very appealing quarterback to block for, um, you would have had to beat them out, which I think is probably unrealistic. And so I know we haven't talked about this, and I know that it's hindsight, but one of the weakest links in your offensive line is your center. Garrett Bradbury continues to be. Like, we celebrate when he's not a train wreck, right? Like, he's never going to give you a stretch of, at least at this point in his career, five or ten games where he's just the anchor of that offensive line, right? Where you're not moving me back, buddy. That's not who he is. He's he's a terrible pass blocking center, and he's been that. He's he was one of the most NFL ready quote unquote players in terms of age and size and experience coming into the draft, and he's he's been a bust so far. Corey Lindsley didn't go sign with the Chiefs. He went and signed with the Chargers, and I get that the Chargers are up and coming, but it wasn't like oh it's a no brainer. Joe Tooney was a no brainer. I'm going to go play for a team that can immediately win the Super Bowl. Corey Lindsley was like, I'm open for business. Who wants to pay me $15 million? And the Vikings had that money that they created, and they gave it to defensive players. And would they have been able to move off of a first-round pick after two years and say, you know what, this is a blow to our egos, but getting an absolute stud in the middle of that offensive line is going to make everyone better. It's going to make Kirk better. But we'd have to admit that we were wildly wrong on a first-round pick two years ago. You know, so that's like in terms of what could have been. I actually look more at Corey Lindsley than I do at Joe Tooney right now. I just think that that on a grand scale, if you look at the entire approach that the Vikings took in trying to say we're not going to rebuild because 2020 was certainly a disappointment, but we are going to be good. Like we're going to pop again. Um, they they took the approach of let's let's try and patch as much as we possibly can as opposed to where are we good where can we potentially build and i'll I'll give you some perfect examples first of all you could have freed up more cash by simply severing ties with anthony barr the the fascination that this team has with we we got to bring him back we got to bring it 2019 i'm signing with the jets but i'd like to come back okay you can come back what huh um 2020 into 21 we need you to take a pay cut why can't that be dude sorry it's done i the patriots because zimmer loves him like i know but but look at what phil bella but look at what belichick and a lot of coaches do they say you know what dude you sort of run your course here great great time we loved you in two years, if you would like to come back and play for $12, that's awesome. You certainly can. But you're done here being a marquee paid player. And now, oh, my God, we freed up a ton of cash. Uh, there's a lot that goes on here from a loyalty standpoint that I think is misguided because it's this thing of we got to re- – I'm all for the Spielman idea of retaining guys out of contract one into contract two. They're your guys. You developed them. They're supposed to be at the zenith of their careers. Great idea. Where I get frustrated is we got to do whatever we can to hold on to Anthony Barr. Where I sort of get frustrated is, and this is probably a hot button one. This might be a hot take. But Harrison Smith, uh, you've got to see the cliff coming. Like, it's your job as a team to be like, okay, the cliff is coming and you're still pretty good, but we're going to push you off the cliff now because you're not as good. Um, That those are the type of moves that put you ahead of the salary cap curb and allow you then to pursue guys. And that's where this team, and I think it's probably more Mike than Rick in that vein. That's where this team frustrates me. And like, look at the defensive players that Mike is loyal to. And it's like, you know, they, they literally have to watch, in their scheme, Xavier Rhodes falling down before they're like, okay, that's enough. Yeah, they've, I, I, and I feel like for a long time, Rick Spielman was sort of the opposite way, right? He wa- he wasn't the guy that was going to hang on to Pat Williams for an extra two years or, or Hutch. whatnot. Steve Hutchinson. Like they, they jettisoned. You're right about that. So I think yeah. this is more of a Mike thing on defense. Yeah. Here, here's another thing, too. Uh, they... 
you know, they've used like 15 starting offensive guards since 2016 or something. Like the last five years or the last six years, basically since like Brandon Fusco, who didn't he start for a couple of years? Not exactly mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a bastion favorite. of stability, but yeah, yeah he was like great. Him. He came on and talked about nipple twisters nipple for like 10 minutes yes. on our show one time. Uh, but they've like it's been a revolving door of guards for five or six years because they can't develop guys that are good enough. I mean, there might be some talent there, but the Vikings haven't been able to develop starting guards to be at least like three and four year anchors. It's just a constant churning of new guys. And now we're going to try Ezra Cleveland over here and Ole Udo over there and cross our fingers. And, you know, you draft Garrett Bradbury and obviously you haven't been able to develop him. So. That's okay. You're not always going to be able to develop every single position. That's why free agency exists, right? But on the defensive side, they've developed Everson Griffin. They've developed Daniil Hunter. I mean, they've done a better job developing, all right, here's a young defensive player. Cam Dantzler is going to come in here as a third-round pick and just, boom, be your best cornerback. And he was your best cornerback again on Sunday when he came in relief of injured Bashad Breeland. So they're very clearly better at – and they're not batting 100% on the on the defensive side but they're better at developing defensive players than they are offensive linemen and so when free agency comes in and the draft comes in shouldn't your approach be all right let's just go sign established offensive linemen that aren't ancient like let's just let's all right we're gonna go get Corey Lindsley because yep. he's established and we're gonna draft defensive players because we know that we can get those yep. guys up to speed pretty quickly to be at least viable starting players and they do it the other way they're like no, we're going to double down on defense in free agency and just sort of cross our fingers when it comes to the interior part of the offensive line to protect Kirk Cousins. It doesn't make sense. It, it kind of reminds me of when you're, uh, like, let's say you're at a bar and you see a pull tab box, okay? And that pull tab box doesn't have a lot of pull tabs left in it. So you kind of think, all right, there's not a lot of pull tabs left. I can see the $500 ones are off, like the big one, big ticket numbers are off, but there's a couple $100 left. There's still probably a, a good amount of dollar and maybe five dollar polls left. Yeah, so you put sure. in forty bucks, thinking, "All right, well, I, I bet I'll get one of those one hundred dollar bills," and then you don't get any of those one hundred dollar bills. <laughs> so then you put in another twenty dollars, and you're thinking, "All right, well, it has to be this time, right?" And at the end of the day, you maybe walked out negative ten. Like it, it, you're not going to hit the home run and find the one hundred dollar pull tab in the in the tiny box that already has all the big ticket numbers gone. Did this That's happen to you last like. night? It hap it's happened before. I, so I figured I figured that it would be a perfect parallel yeah. to Rick Spielman and how he approached free agency and in Declan's defense. gets even more specific. And I'm telling yeah. you, this gal yeah. named Connie yeah. behind yeah. the pull tab <laughs> desk last yeah. night. I was I gonna tip her. I have no interest What's in the deal with pull tabs? In supporting St. Louis Park youth hockey as yeah. much as I currently <laughs> am. So so let's actually expand this conversation to also marry the issues with Zimmer developing players more of late. I feel like when he uh, arrived here, he was doing a good job. I feel like it's waned a little bit there. But let's also include Rick because I'm not sure if you saw this in your travels yesterday, Phil. But Pro Football Focus's Mike Renner had a tweet yesterday. Dude, I'll that walk down the street. I'll walk down the street here. Uh, yeah, Cincinnati had him on the back. meetings. PFF. This is Cincinnati. good. We we delved into this on Purple After Dark with. Uh, with our guy realistic randy yesterday or last night but get this the vikings have used their rookies through four games for nine snaps this season Dude. the seahawks are second to last 46 snaps fo followed by the rams with 91 the titans with 142 and the buccaneers who by the way returned Dude. everybody so like they would have the least reason to use young inexperienced players 144 and i want to talk about so darisaw's bit been hurt and he might start i would guess might start Sunday. he's got us he's got to start let's, on Sunday. Yes, let's, yeah. this is the game to start him yeah i agree but let's delve into again the world of the one guy who i think we've sort of just forgotten about and accepted wyatt davis okay you drafted wyatt davis in the third round which means that's damn near plug and play and he was supposed to play right guard. So it, it was supposed to be Cleveland converted, tackled the guard, moving to left guard. Wyatt Davis, who you drafted in the third round from Ohio State at right guard. And he came into camp, it sounds like, or, or at least the offseason camps, a little bit out of shape, a little bit fat, 
They weren't happy. And so right before camp, and we've discussed this, as far as I can figure, they panicked. And they picked up the phone and they called poor Ole Udo and said, hey, dude, you've been a tackle your whole life, basically, but can you move to right guard? And he has. And for the most part, Cleveland notwithstanding, he's done a pretty nice job. But that doesn't allow, that doesn't excuse the fact that Wyatt Davis has yet to play a snap. Wyatt Davis, who was supposed to play, like there is no, we're not, we're not that wrong about when, when they draft him, right? Like if he had been a sixth round pick then, and we had said, oh, he should start. I'd say, calm down folks. But when you're taken in the third round and you've had as much tr- uh, trouble as you pointed out, Phil at guard as this franchise has had. And all of a sudden you go from third round pick to he can't play. We're not playing him. That's not a Zimmer problem. That's a Spielman drafting problem, and that's a major problem. And and that's why, like, the Bradbury whiff is enormous. There are other centers from that draft who went long after Garrett Bradbury who are productive. Uh, just for context here, speaking of our friends at Pro Football Focus, they do a great job of paying very close attention and grading interior offensive line play that's harder to see when you're watching on TV. Yep. So this season, on a 1-100 to scale, Brian O'Neill... 67.7 so he's kind of down from where he's been the last couple of years but anything above like 60 on a 1 to 100 scale is a is a, an above average solid you know once you get into the 70s you're talking like all right borderline pro bowl 80s 90s is like elite players yep Oli udo has been a 68 and a half he was not good against the browns he got i think he allowed like eight pressures against the browns it was it was a rough one for Big old Ole Udo. Yep. Um, once you get past that, though, it's really rough. Ezra Cleveland, 57.2 out of 100 grade. Garrett Bradbury, a 54.7 and one of the worst pass blockers in the NFL still. Um, and Rashad Hill is a 39.3. He's allowed 18 pressure so far across four games, more than half of them against Miles Garrett. And there's more dudes like Miles Garrett on the way. I'm not saying they're all going to be Miles Garrett, but like, you know, it's not like you get to face at you know at some point you're going to face like five or six other ridiculous pass rushers, and so th- this is a great week for Darisau to start. But I guess my point here is for anyone that's going to be like, well, I mean, Ezra Cleveland's been okay. I mean, he's playing a foreign position. He's been below average. Garrett Brad, it's like we're clinging to well, they're kind of average, you know. I don't know. It's like, well, <laughs> why can't the, why can't the Vikings have guys that are dominant up front right it's like we've lowered our expectations so much and they've done such a crappy job of finding and developing and signing those guys that it's literally like well I guess you know okay he's not terrible is sort of our bar for measurement now unfortunately yeah and that's the and that's the problem that extends to this your quarterback needs a good line like we can the Kirk stands and people like Mackey Judd and Declan can all come together and sing kumbaya on one thing Kirk needs a good line. That's not a debatable topic. That's not yes. like, well, he started to run a little bit more. So have you seen that? No, he needs to have. And, and and for that, I don't blame him because we've seen it. We've seen it a ton. When he has good protection, he's great. When he doesn't, he panics. And 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 as Boone said, too, yeah. a good offensive line. Boone was great on, on this um, on Purple Daily yesterday. A good offensive line and one that's cocky and confident lifts the quarterback up and says it's going to be fine dude sorry you Mm -hmm. got knocked down but we're going to keep you clean like there is there's a reason why and again i'm not dumping on kirk but there's a reason why on sunday his play declined it wasn't just because of the rushes it was also because he was seeing ghosts but how is he not you know in his defense you're going to. He's and, bad against pressure, and he and he starts to see ghosts when he feels pressure, yes. which which is a flaw. And there's other quarterbacks that that don't but drop you know all that. It. But it's like you can do a much better job of giving him more clean pockets. Yes, and they don't, and they don't, and they never. And like, who is the guy who can say the bleeding stops now? Mm-hmm. Like we're stopping this. Yeah, Brian O'Neill. Yeah, well, Kirk Kirk needs more insurance, is what I'm sensing from this discussion. <laughs> and Federated Insurance is Kirk. here to help you when it comes to risk management. Also think about this, if there's a, you know, there's a fire inside the pocket, 
and Kirk's got to get out, right? How solid is your business's fire prevention plan? Are your electrical systems up to date? Your left guard, your right guard? Uh, are your systems in working order? Do you have plans in place with employees when it comes to fire prevention and uh, management? Federatedinsurance.com has a ton of resources when it comes to risk management, fire prevention management, etc. Find out more at federatedinsurance.com. And remember at Federated, it's our business to protect yours. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I think some of that's hindsight 2020. Some of it's first guess, and the Vikings are just uh, you know, sort of failing in these areas in front of our eyes like we thought. But the Lions can be a good elixir, I guess. We'll see what happens on Sunday. Do you have one more thought before we get to read that? I was down, just go- going to say that rookie um, stat is incredibly bad. Like, that's not excusable. You've well, they've drafted nine... more players. They, haven't they drafted like 38 yeah. players the last and... three years or something? And like, and very, very little to show for it on the field to this point. But we know? get fooled by it. Like, we're like, look at all these players. Look at the weight, the breadth of this draft class. Also, well, if they don't you know, play, who cares? Wouldn't you, in a, in a win now window, which they've been in over the last three years, wouldn't you want to be exchanging draft capital for either higher percentage players in the draft? Like, wouldn't you want to be moving up to specifically target the best player? Or using draft capital to get established players that are four and five year veterans that are coming up on contracts, like like the Rams do, right? The Rams have said, "All right, this is probably going to hurt us in five years, but damn it, we want to win a Super Bowl right now, and so we're just going to trade first round picks every year, right?" I think trading down has be- become akin to a magic trick. Hey, look, Wilfs, I've traded down and I got three more draft picks. Abra, look at the Abra. Look at the value. Yeah. Look, here's three more draft picks. Abra, and Abra. <laughs> I just traded a traded a high third for you know a fifth, a sixth, a seventh. Look at this. Uh, it's yeah, yes, I would agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, well, that's another conversation probably for uh, for Purple Daily. So, all right, Mackie and Judd, let's do some write that down predictions and accountability send, uh, session. When are you going to admit that you were wrong? Everybody Coming up that. next.